I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement. And my guest today is Noah Levine. There is this mind, there is this body that are impermanent processes. There is this consciousness and a level of our consciousness, which we call memory, that creates a sense of self. We think, I'm me because I remember who I used to be. And I'm aware of right now and I have some memory of then. So this, you know, there must be some sort of solid, continuous self here. And this is where, under meditative investigation, as Bob was pointing out, you begin to see that even that self, there is no solid, continuous self. But it's, it's a tricky uh, subject because philosophically it doesn't make as much sense as the direct experience of emptiness. Of, and I think actually even the terminology is important. It's not no self. It's no solid, separate, permanent self. Noah Levine, the author of the national bestseller Dharma Punks, is a Buddhist teacher, counselor, and writer. He has been practicing Buddhist meditation since 1988, was trained to teach by Jack Kornfield, and leads meditation groups and workshops, nationally as well as in juvenile halls and prisons. Levine holds a master's degree in counseling psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies and has studied with many well-known and respected teachers in both the Theravada and Mahayana traditions. Welcome, Noah. Thank you. And you have written a book called Against the Stream. And you also wrote a book called Dharma Punks. How did you come to write Dharma Punks, first of all? Well, Dharma Punks is my memoir. So it's the story of my own uh, troubled youth and... uh, uh, pseudo-rebellion and, and punk rock uh, uh, participation and drug addiction and uh, Did you play recovery. Rock and, did you play rock and roll? Not as a musician, no, just as yeah. part of a you know, kind of early 80s part of the scene. punk culture. And, yeah. and then having come to Buddhism and spiritual practice as a kind of way to channel my rebellion and to recover from addiction and uh, you know, as a sort of positive uh, rebellion also, I'm a long-term uh, recovery person, 12-step recovery. Oh, yeah. So having been uh, so involved in that and the way that the kind of teaching goes there, the way that I relate to teaching best is when people tell me their personal experience. I don't want to be lectured at. I don't want you to tell me what I should do. But if you tell me what you've done, I can hear it. I can relate. I can apply that to myself. And so that's why I put Dharma Punks you know, out as this is what I have done. This is my experience Take it for what it is. Do with it what you like. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what I've done. Well, and you've obviously found it useful, the practice of Buddhism. And uh, would you say you're a practitioner of Theravada? For the most part, inspired by Theravada. um, But, you know, pretty eclectic. You know, I definitely am very inspired by some of the Mahayana teachings. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to it, I have most confidence and most faith and what the Buddha originally taught and what is recorded in the suttas. Uh, you know, I do feel that some of the later Mahayana interpretations uh, are not the teachings of the Buddha and are in direct contradiction to what the Buddha originally taught. Well, and that's really what Theravada means is teaching of the elders. You know, you the know, old school. The old school. <laughs> well, you went back to the old school, man, <laughs> from the hard way, it sounds like. <laughs> The new book that you've got is called Against the Stream, and it's about an inner evolution of reality being radical and subversive, radical, subversive, personal rebellion. And you talk about that Buddha was a a radical. How do you mean? Well, very much so. I think that, for one, it was so radical of him to reject his wealth, wealth and privilege. You know, like he, he came from this wealthy... Uh, upper ruling class and he rejected all of it. He let go of his inheritance, his physical material inheritance as a rejection of the material wealth, as a rejection of stuff equaling happiness. He saw, I've got all of this stuff. It doesn't work. I'm still dissatisfied. I still have to do this over and over again in this reincarnation philosophy. You know, like, it doesn't matter how much stuff you have, you die without it. (laughs) So there was that quality. And then his, um, the way that he approached spiritual practice, I feel, was incredibly radical. And, um, you know, he he went and he sought out the highest gurus, spiritual teachers, traditions of his time in the Indian culture. 
And it's said in the mythology and history of Buddhism that he attained the highest enlightenments available through those teachers. He studied with several different teachers. Mm -hmm. And he rejected them because he trusted himself. Now, how radical is that? You know, he's going, he's going to a teacher and the teacher's saying, you're enlightened, right? Which is what everyone wants to hear. They want the guru's blessings and, and these gurus are saying, you're enlightened now and I want you to rule the community with me. And we get all of this power and prestige and, you know, you can be my right hand man. And the, and the Buddha every time said, you know, that's all very well, but I'm still attached. I'm still aversive. I'm still identified with this body as self. I am not free from suffering. So I don't want your power and prestige. I don't want your temporary concentration meditation techniques. I want permanent freedom, not temporary meditative elation. And so he kept rejecting these yogis and these gurus. Uh, and I think it was quite radical that he trusted himself and was so you know, rigorously honest that he went on and went on until he found final liberation. And from that balance, uh, he decided, okay, I need to eat regularly, I need to exercise, I need to sit and walk in meditation. Um, most of what I feel is really radical. I mean, so those, those are some of the things. Right. But really it was later, after his enlightenment. First of all, when he, after, at his enlightenment, he referred to freedom from suffering as being subversive, as being an act of rebellion. He, he uttered the, the Pali word in the Theravada, patiso tagami. And that translates as against the stream. When he was reflecting on how did I get here, he said, I went against. I went against the religious structures that were offered to me. I went against the material structures of this world. He said, and I went against myself. I went against this misidentification with my mind and body, craving for pleasure, aversion to pain. He said, this internal rebellion, this against the stream, path that I have walked out of my own effort, he said it was radical. So that really resonated with you? Really, really resonated and with me. He was me. dead honest about it. He was dead honest. And then he didn't just say, okay, I'm enlightened. I'm going to enjoy my spiritual bliss. Right. He spent the rest of his life, seven years of intensive spiritual practice for his enlightenment. 45 years of walking barefoot town to town to help others, to be of service. And in that process, uh, ma major societal, social uh, engagement, breaking down the sexist structure of ancient India, the first uh, to let women into the community and to acknowledge that, you know, in this way, the Buddha was a feminist. He, he was the first Indian spiritual teacher on this level to acknowledge women could get enlightened. Before this, and, and even currently in many of the Indian systems, women are thought of as inferior in this oh, sexist oppression. Some uh, Indian places won't even let women into the inner sanctums of the um, shrines. And the Buddha was blowing this apart, you know, breaking it down. Very radical. And he was getting a lot of hassle for it because the structure, he was letting women leave their families and be nuns. And so the society was in an uproar. How dare you tear across, you know, part the, you know, the, the oppressive substratum of our society. And the same thing with race. He also was breaking down the racist structure, the caste system. Yeah. Yeah. Only the Brahmins were allowed, you know, only the warrior class were allowed to do spiritual practice. You had to pay the priests to say your Sanskrit prayers for you. In this time, Boy, that sounds a lot like the early Catholic stuff. Some of the Catholic stuff, maybe not what, so early, well, but, <laughs> even <I> mean, current. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, what came from the Protestant thing about uh, one of the things that Martin Luther bringing it back uh, uh, rebelled against about uh, paying off the priest to to do your obeisance for you. And so you know those kind of social things, breaking down the sexist and racist culture. And he was very you know he was engaged with speaking out against war, speaking out against all forms of violence, all forms of greed and hatred. So more than just Buddhism as or the Buddha as this statue that is enlightened, but really as an engaged spiritual activist, is is my view. You know, is really how I see the Buddha, and I, I believe it's very true, historically correct. Mm -hmm. 
And you've chosen to embody that. Well, I... I mean, to be the spiritual <laughs> activist, right? For sure. I mean, I, I, I mean, feel you like... You talking to me otherwise. I know? feel like... I don't even like to call myself a Buddhist, but I definitely feel like I am a student of the Buddha. He, you know, he is one of the historical beings that I try to emulate, that I follow, that I take advice from, that I, uh, you know, honor because I've tried this stuff for the last 20 years and it really has worked indirectly in my experience. So not blind faith, religious faith, but verified experiential faith. Well, there's a couple of things, too. One of them is that uh, Buddha said, uh, don't believe me. I've heard Bob Thurman talk about this. He said, don't believe me. Don't uh, do it for yourself. Don't, don't follow any teacher. You know, unless it's real to you, it, it's meaningless. Yeah. And, and I really, you know, sitting across from you, get a sense that if you're going to do something, you do it full on. Yeah. <laughs> you just do it full on and, and you don't compromise. And um, this is uh, something that, that really uh, resonated with you. I mean, and that's, as you say, that's one of my favorite things about Buddhism is that I don't, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of faith. I'm a, a pretty skeptical person when it comes to religion. And I grew up, uh, you know, really anti-religion. Yeah. On, in my own punk rock rebellion. Yeah. So to find a, a tradition like Buddhism that isn't trying to make you believe anything, although actually I could critique Buddhism. I think that a lot of Buddhism is quite corrupt. But the original Buddha who made this statement, don't believe anything. Right. He wasn't trying to be a guru. He wasn't trying to be your spiritual master. He was saying, this is what I have found to be true for me. You have to find out what is true for yourself. Uh, how is it that Buddhism is spiritual, but it isn't a religion? Well, I don't know that it's not a religion. I oh, okay. think that it is a religion. But, but Buddha was not a Buddhist. Exactly. Well, Christ wasn't a <laughs> right, Christian, and right. Muhammad wasn't a Muslim. And, right, right. You know, but as these things go, there are spiritual teachings that turn into religions. Yeah. Now... His practice some, was spiritual. Some might say that religion, is, by definition, is about, about God. His philosophy is about God, is theistic. So if that's the definition, then Buddhism is non-theistic, so it's not a religion. But the truth is, up until 40 years ago when China went communist, there were more Buddhists on this planet than anything else, more than Christians, more than Muslims, because of the billions in Asia that were all... Buddhist. Mm -hmm. It's a religion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it has all the problems that all religions have. As far as religions go, I think it's a pretty good one. Some of the other religions seem to be way worse off than Buddhism, but Buddhist religion has its problems too. Yeah, well, we can talk about those when we come back. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and I'm talking with my guest, Noah Levine, and he's written a new book called Against the Stream, and uh, you were previously the author of uh, Dharma Punks. How can people get a hold of you, Noah? I guess the best way is my website, dharmapunks.com. It's www.dharmapunx. That's punks with an X, not a KS. Uh, and that's the best. There's also againstthestream.com. There's also noahlevine.com. But Dharma Punks has the most information on it and links to the other sites. Great. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, Noah Levine, who has written a book called Against the Stream and previously is the author of Dharma Punks. And uh, before the break, we were talking about problems that Buddhism has as a religion. But getting back to Buddha himself, he was saying, don't believe the teachers. Well, you know, I mean, it's such a, a specific context, but, uh, you know, for our listeners on this show who are out in West Marin in San Francisco, it's not so different. This, this context of that teaching from the Buddha there is a people, a village called the Kalamas. And for some reason in the Kalama Sutta, this village happened to be on the guru circuit. <laughs> just as uh, West Marin is on the you know guru circuit, just as the whole, Gulch, we got the whole Spirit Bay Rock, Area got, is sort of on yeah. the on the guru circuit, and you got yeah you've got these you know the Dalai Lama coming through this day right, and this right. guru coming through that day, and you've got Spirit Rock over here and Green Gulch over there, and and you know these people, these West Marin people, are saying you know why should we believe you? There was some other guru here last week telling us something a little different. Right. 
And they all kind of are telling us something different. And, you know, how should we define real teachings and real spirituality? And the Buddha was quite clear. He said, well, first of all, listen, reflect. Uh, don't believe anything based on tradition just because it's Buddhism just because it's this or that. Ne that's not a good qualification for faith, for belief, because it's been around for a long time or because... He said, don't believe anything based on a charismatic presentation because you get that too, right? You get these guys and they're really selling it, you know? And it club, sounds, sounds good, right? Charismatic. Pat Robertson. Then. <laughs> yeah, he, he, says, he says, basically, listen to teachings, reflect deeply on them, apply them to your life. If they lead to less suffering, they are good dharma, good truth. If they lead to more suffering, they are not the dharma. Abandon them. The acid test there. The acid test. So very practical, very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk to you about the three salient marks of sentient existence that I read about uh, studying Buddhism. One of them is anicca, that everything undergoes a change. Uh, the next one is dukkha, that um, life is suffering. And the third one is anatma, the absence of anything enduring. Mm -hmm. So, Sure, where should I start? I mean, I think that the place to start with this yeah. is anicca, yeah. is the impermanent nature of all phenomena, that everything is constantly changing. Every cell in our body is regenerating. Every thought that we have is arising and passing. Every emotion is in process, every sensation. In the external world, things, you know, our eyes aren't so good at catching the impermanence and we think, well, this structure feels pretty right, solid, right. you know, this yeah. feels uh, like it's not changing, it's here, it's been here for 10 years, it's well, going to stay here. I'm not changing, I'm right. me. Right. So, of course, this is where science helps us on the impermanence level. you got a big enough telescope, you can see all of the atoms moving so quickly. Nothing is solid. Nothing is stable. And that's what quantum, quantum physics has quantum brought us physics, to. Quantum physics, the constantly changing momentum of all things. Yep, yep. And Bob Thurman was even talking about uh, Buddha is super scientist. For and, sure. And uh, that uh, Buddha was trying to catch his reified self, and he couldn't. Right. Yeah, and then you can't he, catch the shadow. That's right. And, he, <laughs> and, and, and Thurman said a weird thing about the, the, the faster you chase it, the faster it would run away from you. Right. And finally, uh, Buddha uh, blew out. And that's the word for nirvana and found shunyata, which is emptiness. And um, talk to us about emptiness. Well, I think that, you know, as you're pointing to, as Bob points to, because of impermanence, there is this mind, there is this body that are impermanent processes. There is this consciousness and a level of our consciousness, which we call memory, that creates a sense of self. We think, I'm me because I remember who I used to be. And I'm aware of right now and I have some memory of then. So this, you know, there must be some sort of solid, continuous self here. And this is where, under meditative investigation, as Bob was pointing out, you begin to see that even that self, there is no solid, continuous self. But it's, it's a tricky uh, subject because philosophically it doesn't make as much sense as the direct experience of emptiness. Of, and I think actually even the terminology is important. It's not no self. It's no solid, separate permanent self. No, no separated. It's empty of separateness. Empty of separateness. Now, because sometimes we say there's no self, and that's just not true. There is a self. I'm me, you're you. You're yourself, I'm myself. Mm -hmm. The Buddha says, but there's two truths. There's the relative truth, which is that I am the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, with right, this right. conditioning and this lineage, and this, and this is what I have to say to you, and I use the term I, you know, and the Buddha says that. I need to say I. He's like, but there's a second level. That's the relative. He says the second level, the ultimate truth, which is that there is no I, me, or mine. This is a process unfolding that there's nothing in here that I can attach to as permanent, as solid, as me. Mm -hmm. And so kind of relating on a relative self level, on an ultimate no self level. We have to be really careful about this conversation, I think, because I think that there's been a lot of 
uh, corruption, a lot of abuse behind this philosophy, a lot of lack of taking responsibility. Like, well, uh, there's no self here, so right, I'm not responsible right. for my actions. And that's BS. Right. You're fully responsible for your actions. And that's another thing I think that attracted you is that it was just, you know, completely earnest practical. For sure. There was no, uh, no uh, BS about it. Yeah. You know, so then the third level, you know, so there's the impermanent nature of all things. And then what we can say is that the self also is impermanent. Mm -hmm. Anicca and anatta connected. Oh, they do. Well, yeah, because it's all impermanent and self is impermanent. Well, that's right. And that's why I started with impermanence. And dukkha also mm -hmm. is an so. outcome of impermanence. The reason that we suffer so much, one of the reasons that we suffer so much, that we create so much difficulty for ourselves, is that we're trying to hold on to impermanence. Right? Pleasure comes, and it's impermanent, and we suffer when it leaves, because we're clinging to it. Uh, dukkha is a little bit like the rope burns that we experience because we're clinging to, we're grasping at that which is being pulled beyond our ability to hold. Yep. So in that way, pleasure is suffering if you're attached to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're not attached to it, pleasure is very pleasant. You enjoy it. You enjoy your relationships, your connections, your experiences in life if you're not clinging. If you are clinging, you suffer. Yeah. On the other level, of course, is the pain. Mm -hmm. Pain also comes unbited, unwanted, yep. unable to get rid of it, but it is also impermanent. If we learn to accept pain as it is impermanent and let it come through us rather than meeting it with aversion, pushing against it, creating, uh, you know, I, I use the analogy of the rope burn for the clinging and then it's like for the aversion it's like creating a dam as like when in our in our vain attempt to get rid of pain we're letting we're making it hang around we're stopping that stream of unpleasantness from just passing through letting it go letting it pass instead of processing it completely yeah suzuki roshi says uh, uh sometimes when we sit in these meditation halls we get really cold and sometimes it's just really cooking in there he says when you're cold be a cold buddha when you're hot, be a hot Buddha. I just love that. Yeah, that's the practice. Yeah, let it, let it be. So, there, I mean, I think that they're all connected centrally around impermanence, uh, that one of our biggest problems is our lack of harmony, our lack of being in balance with the impermanent nature of things, and a delusion that we have that we think we can create a life that is always pleasant and never painful, mm -hmm. and this reactive habit that we human beings have of meeting pain with hatred rather than love and compassion. So is that how, I mean, I get a sense that you've really leaned into this impermanence. You've really leaned into this uh, full bore. And, and is that how we embrace the impermanence is with love and compassion? Of course, ultimately, our intention is to be loving and kind to the impermanent uh, experience of life. You know, and one of the ways that the Buddha encourages that is to reflect on death on a daily basis. You know, really acknowledge that this lifetime uh, can, you know, is not guaranteed. That this physical being, this, ex this, this is a temporary phenomena. Really don't take it for granted. Don't postpone your well-being, your spiritual awakening uh, for some future time. Acknowledge on a daily basis that this could be it. Do, what are you going to do today? Appreciate your life today for what it is because the present is, not, or the present is all that you have. The future is not guaranteed. And is this one of the ways that we link from the absolute to the relative? I think so. Because that's always a puzzle. I mean, um, I know myself to be Anthony, but at a level there really is no Anthony because Anthony's tried to hold on to these ropes and gotten terrible rope burn and just blown out and then now what yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. but then um, so I guess it's really about how do we practice this to to have that continuum of the relative to the absolute and be in harmony well 
the foundation is present time awareness. Of course. And that's also about the, the meditation? It's mindfulness. It's, okay, it's yeah. paying attention. It's In present this time. Right now. What's happening right now? It's just sounds. It's just sensations. It's, it's just feelings, emotions, visions. Mm -hmm. You know, just being present with what is here and now. And seeing, well, how am I reacting to what's happening right now? Oh, this is unpleasant. It's warm in this studio as we do this interview. Being just a, a warm Buddha <laughs> rather than aversive and <laughs> right. you know, judgmental or any of that. I'm just like, oh, okay, it's just temperature. So Buddha teaches about being a student of your own awareness. Of course. And just, you know, but this is also part of the against the stream ethic is that uh, the untrained mind, the Buddha said, it's like the monkey mind. Oh, right. You know, right. it's not so easy to pay attention to be a student of your own awareness because we're uh, survival-based conditioning to be constantly planning. Mm -hmm. And as we're sitting here thinking about what's next and where we're going and what our plans are and how are we going to create more pleasure for ourselves in our life, how are we going to avoid pain? And this survival psyche that we have that is constantly swinging to the future, to the past, re reflecting on our resentments, on, re you know, uh, reminiscing about the pleasures of the past. So even just pleasant, present time awareness, even just mindfulness of the here and now is a subversive rebellion against your own mind. You know, this is really like, it's radical just to get your mind to pay attention, to stay still for a moment. You know, it's not the mind's nature. No. It's not the, our tendency. No. It takes great effort and intentional training just to be present. And even just being present is not enough. Then we have to investigate, how am I relating to the present? Am I attached? I can only let go right now. Am I angry? I can only let go right now. So present time awareness, prerequisite, investigation, uh, and letting go and, and uncovering compassion, requisite. And it all has to take place right now, not sometime in the future, not what we let go of yesterday. Right. What are we letting go of right now? Mm -hmm. What are we attached to right now? Mm -hmm. And how can we let go? Right. How can we create less suffering for ourselves and the world? And of course, the conversation has to go towards as the Buddha did, mm -hmm. using our life's energy to create positive change in this planet. Well, we'll have to take a break, uh, and we'll come and talk to that uh, point after we get back. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today. Uh, I'm talking with my guest, Noah Levine, who has uh, just written a book called Against the Stream, a Buddhist Manual for Spiritual Revolutionaries. And how can people get a hold of you, Noah? Um, dharmapunks.com is a good way. Uh, D-H-A-R-M-A-P-U-N-X dot com. Uh, also on MySpace. I don't know what well, my MySpace, MySpace address is, though. No, it's important. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, Noah at MySpace. I'm not sure. Anyways, I've, there's, it's a big, you know, there's a, a lot of pages on there about if you Google Dharma or if you put Dharma punks or against the stream into MySpace, uh, it'll, that'll also, my page will come up. Great. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break and we're going to be right back. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, Noah Levine. And, and Noah has just written a book called Against the Stream, a Buddhist Manual for Spiritual Revolutionaries. And during the break, Noah, you just had said that uh, your book is Pick of the Month on MySpace. So uh, this, you have written this in a way that is really accessible. To people. Yeah, yeah, it's great, you know, on the MySpace. Young people, particularly. <clears throat> yeah, I think also a lot of young people. It was very interesting as this got the pick of the month or whatever they do there for MySpace and the millions of people that are on MySpace. Oh, yeah. Now. And in the write up, they gave it a very nice write up, but they talked a lot about Dharma punks. Um, the person that did it had, was a fan of Dharma punks, and they said, okay, Noah Levine, you know, Dharma punks now offers this new Buddhist manual to help floundering punk rockers. <laughs> Where nowhere in Against the Stream does it talk about punk rock or that this is for a specific, uh, you know, culture or age or, or social group. Um, but that was their take on it, right? Uh -huh. And so the conversation on MySpace <clears throat> was around what is and isn't punk rock. And there was like a, over a thousand posts, I think, of people going back and forth, the vast majority of who never read Against the Stream or Dharma punks putting in their opinions about if spirituality and punk rock are um, 
uh, what? Mutually uh, exclusive? Mu mutually exclusive. <laughs> so it was quite interesting. And then, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, who had read it, you know, saying nice things and stuff like that. Oh, but that's very cool. Yeah, great. It was very generous of them to do. And But, I mean, this is a real radical notion to study one's own consciousness. And then, uh, and you talk about meditation trainings, and maybe that's what's next about about uh, or let's go back to the fundamentals of revolution because you're talking about once you once you uh, get a handle on your own consciousness then what then how do you take it out into the world well I think it's different for everyone yeah. uh, for me it's been doing a lot of work within institutions working in prisons and juvenile halls uh, helping to train other people to do that also having the vision um, as Bob Thurman does, I mean, I even quote him in my book here about, you know, it, Bob Thurman has done so much for <clears throat> Tibet and social activism and, and teaching Buddhism. And when he's asked what his most important contribution is, he says, raising wise children. With that bigger perspective that it's not about actually what I do, it's about what I pass on and the next generations do. Wow. You know, this bigger view that it's not this selfish, you know, how many books did I sell? It's about how did I use my life energy to leave a legacy for the children and for the next generation and the next generation. And did I help them wake up to what's really uh, so that's, appropriate to be tracking? So you know? although I'm not a father yet, um, I, I've done a lot of work with kids and a lot of work in the, within the institutions with children. And, and I do feel passionately about the importance of uh, passing it on and training others to pass it on and you know this sort of uh, pay it forward being of service and I you know I said I don't think it matters that much you know like you can uh, choose your battle whether it's an environmental activist or it's a social uh, you know sexist racist you know whatever you doesn't there's so many causes there's so much abuse there's so much oppression that what is important is that we get involved you know, and uh, on some level, I feel like it's quite good. You know, like you were telling me with your history in music, yeah. and then you are kind of going on to work in that industry uh, as a as a piano tuner and doing that. Like for me, it's like my history in jail. So I work in jails, <laughs> you know. And it's like if you're a Marin housewife, there's a lot of uh, suffering, you know, right there in Marin uh, with you know with women and abuse and. It's like you don't have to go out to San Quentin and work with people that you have no idea where they come from. You can work right there in your own community and mm -hmm. make a difference. It was a shock to me to learn uh, the amount of abuse directed uh, from adolescents to their parents in Marin County. Uh, and you'd think, well, it's a real affluent place, but having grown up in an upper middle class suburb myself, I understand that that's kind of an emotional desert there. If a lot of folks substitute soul uh, a substitute cash for soul, you know. But uh, I want to come back to the fundamentals of, of this revolution. And, and you talk about uh, eight qualities about uh, generosity, compassion, loving kindness, equanimity, uh, heart, mind, liberation, um, cultivation, and, and abandonment, interdependency, and forgiveness. So talk about these fundamentals and, and how they. I think most of us maybe need to start with some forgiveness. Yeah. You know, we're, we have such judgmental minds. You know, we human beings tend to suffer from low self-esteem and self-critical. You know, we're stuck with this survival-based mentality and this superego, psychologically termed, that's constantly trying to protect us. So every time we get hurt, our mind says, that was stupid. That got hurt. You're dumb. Don't do that again. Don't put yourself in that situation or they're stupid, or this isn't safe, or that isn't safe. And just the way our, our psychology works, we need to be able to forgive this mind and this heart that builds up uh, you know, so much resistance and so much uh, armoring in order to try to protect ourselves from betrayals, from heartbreaks, from disappointments, from living in this impermanent realm where everything is constantly dying. And the average, ordinary, everyday grief that we're all in denial of, that we're not feeling uh, correctly, that we're not allowing to be present. 
And so forgiveness as, a, as an opening of the heart, loving kindness as a training of the heart, compassion as a wise response to this grief. We begin to see, uh, as uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says uh, about the communist Chinese, my friends, the enemy. We begin to see how we have been our own worst enemy at times and how our enemies are also suffering, are also confused, that even the oppressors uh, need compassion, need forgiveness. Now, it gets deeper when we start talking about forgiveness, as I do in the book, that we're not into forgiving actions, but we are into forgiving actors. The Holocaust, Tibet, Iraq, where, you know, choose your battle, the invasion of North America, you know, and, and slaughter of the native peoples and rightful inhabitants of this land. Not forgivable, the action. But the ignorance of those individuals that make up communist China, of those individuals that make up our government, of those individuals that thought it was okay to come and rape and pillage this land. Their ignorance, their confusion their pain that spilled out in so many ways, we can have compassion for that. It's the same pain that we also hold. And so that's the level of forgiveness for the individuals, for the actors, not the actions. And as we see clearly that there is a Hitler within each one of us, that there is a George W. Bush and that kind of, you know, like people hate George W. I'd imagine most of your listeners, I don't know, West Marin, there might be a bunch of, I don't want to get too, uh, <laughs> I don't want to get too political here. But for me, it's like, think of the house that that kid grew up in with his father as the CIA and then the president. And so imagine the kind of ignorance and uh, conditioning and ma imagine being that little boy trying to please daddy who grew into the man that's still trying to please daddy, who, you know, is so deluded and so completely ignorant to what he has done, to what he is doing. I can have compassion for that little boy suffering so much, so ignorant, so just wanting to be loved and not getting what he needed, and that he took it out on a global scale as all monsters of history have done. So taking it into the personal, you know, I can see my own suffering in my childhood and how I could have become, you know, so, something well, more awful than I did. <laughs> well, I mean, this is not a bad gig, man, that you're doing. I mean, I'm, but I'm just wondering, I mean, when you go into these jails, I mean, that's just hardcore there, man. And it, and it just seems like, I mean, um, it, it seems like that you've been able to be effective there. To a point. Well, it helps too that I, you know, I did a bunch of time as a kid. I was in oh, and out okay. of institutions from the time I was 12, okay. and I got clean and, and started meditating when I was locked up. So, mm -hmm. you know, they are my people. I didn't do a lot of adult time, but you know, I'm, I'm a three-time felon and all of that stuff. So they can relate. Oh, my personal story okay. relates. It's not just somebody coming up from outside. I'm saying... not just a white do-gooder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, you know ex-con so that helps um you know and then sometimes i feel like you know there, there was this one guy i was working with at san quentin and i felt like and he's in there for murder and i felt like you know how am i going to help this guy you know i got a, you know i've been out since i was 18 and you know my life is, is so much different and when he read dharma punks and he read my story he said to me he said you know my childhood wasn't much worse than yours He's like, but the choices that I made behind that, that got me here, behind my pain, the way I let my pain spill out onto other people, he said, I realized um, that I wasn't the victim that I thought I was and that it really was about the choices of how I dealt with my pain. He said, because I saw how you dealt with your pain and that you made that turnaround. He's like, and now here doing you know, this time in prison, I'm choosing to make that turnaround. I hope it's not too late. Well, he's still alive. Yeah, I actually think he got out. Oh, really? Well, and I've also, I mean, and you talk, uh, you hear about in, in various of these spiritual paths um, about moksha or liberation. And uh, from what I come to understand about liberation, it's freedom to choose. Is that, would you say that's correct? 
Yeah, maybe freedom to choose, maybe real liberation, uh, I might say, is that uh, it's a consistent choice not to suffer. Not just I could choose not to suffer, but I am choosing to suffer. I think that a real Buddha is someone who is no longer attached to pleasure, no longer aversive to pain, no longer identified with this mind-body process as self, and that no longer suffers. That doesn't mean that a Buddha, that somebody who's attained enlightenment, doesn't experience pain. This is very important. Pain is a given, enlightened or not. An enlightened being just relates to the pain with pure compassion, not aversion, not hatred, not resistance, not denial. And for wherever it's needed, to oneself or to... Because I understand the whole world. Buddha had uh, some serious medical conditions when he died, and he must have been in some significant pain. Sure. No, the Buddha's life, it seemed like, you know, like, you think, oh, he was the Buddha, right? Must have been good to be him. But he also had these thousands of people surrounding him, wanting his time, his attention, his teachings. And then there started to be all these problems in the community. He had, uh, you know, rivals within the community that wanted the power. He, they, they, there was murder assassination plots against the Buddha where they were trying to kill him. His cousin Devadatta wanted the power and was out to murder the Buddha and was like, you know, just that, you know, the Buddha's life wasn't as, you know, maybe easy even after enlightenment. Like there's still a lot of stress, a big community uh, on vultures, you know, peak his... Uh, his cousin is trying to murder him. He's throwing boulders down the, the hill at him, it said. And as he steps out of the way, it smashes his foot. So then for the end of his life, he's got this like, broken foot, you know. His back is going out because he's old and, and walking barefoot all, you know, around all the time. So enlightenment is not freedom from pain or difficulty or old age or sickness. It is freedom from suffering from resistance to the sickness, to the stress, to the old age, to the difficulty. It's a radical change in our relationship to life. Not that life gets easy and pleasant all the time, but that we have an ease with whatever arises. We're going to have to take a short break. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest Noah Levine. And Noah originally wrote Dharma Punks, and he's written a new book called Against the Stream. And how can people get a hold of you, Noah? Um, dharmapunks.com or MySpace or, uh, I don't know, I teach regularly at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. Oh, you do? So. Oh, that's cool. So people can right, check in on Through their website. Yeah. There's a link to mine. And, Great. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. I'm Anthony Wright and I'm your host today on Attunement and we're talking with my guest Noah Levine. And Noah has written, first of all, a book called Dharma Punks and now a book called Against the Stream, a Buddhist Manual for Spiritual Revolutionaries. Before the break, Noah, we were talking about that Buddha really had to have compassion for himself about his own body breaking down in old age and so forth. I, I did want to come to the point, though, of talking about the training about how one comes to be so compassionate and unattached with one's own experience in the moment and to be able to have such openness. Without intensive, intentional meditation training, I think it's impossible. I don't think uh, no matter how many teachings you attend, no matter how many books you read, if you don't get your ass on the meditation cushion and deeply investigate your own mind and reactive habitual tendencies, you will continue floating downstream in the dissatisfactory nature of your life as it has always been. If you want wisdom and compassion, you have to work for it. You have to do the work. You have to sit down and look inside and uncover the compassion that is buried beneath the aversion, the attachment, the denial of impermanence. We're looking outside for our salvation too often. It's right here inside. You're not going to find it by just sitting down for five minutes. You might find it if you sit down for a half hour 45 minutes every day for the next seven years. So you still continue to meditate? Of course. And um, what benefit do you find in that? Well, the more, uh, you know, and it's real gradual. It's not a quick fix. But over the years, like I'm 
coming up on 20 years of practicing meditation. And I really like what the Dalai Lama said when he said, you know, only check in on your progress every decade. You know, <laughs> commit to it, continue it, and see what happens. And I see for myself that every, you know, few years when I check in, I'm suffering less. I'm more content. It's easier for me to accept life as it is. I'm creating less problems for myself, less problems for other people. And I'm able to use my time and energy to try to help, to try to educate, to try to uh, be an ally to the oppressed and to not use my life to create oppression. So the benefits are manifold, you know, for myself and then the reverberations that go out. In the beginning, mostly people, and myself included, we come to meditation because we think maybe it'll save our lives, it'll help us. Personal. There's almost always, if you're sincere about it, if you're doing it right, a, a corner that we turn that it's not so much about me anymore and that it's more and more about the world. It turns from a, a, a selfish to an altruistic motivation. I continue to meditate, I continue to attend retreats and teach and do what I do with my life, not only for myself, but for the benefit of all living beings. But you have not abandoned any of your core principles that you began in the punk world with, though, right? Well, <laughs> I mean, the real, I mean, being true, yeah. to, true, true to the self yeah. and being really dedicated to whatever path it was that you were on, I mean, you, you continue to go into that full bore. For sure, and uh, on some level, I mean, I, I laugh because, you know, some of what I was committed to was, you know, fuck authority, <laughs> beep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, what I was, a, 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 you know, committed to as a punk was, you know, rejecting everything and everyone on some levels. So I've become a little bit more discerning about my rebellion, but still very much my life is well, you're about committed to that, though, creating positive change. And I can see that that person who had that real strong aversion to authority had a real valid, uh, a valid uh, uh, point to, to, to live. And I'm still averse to, to authority. I mean, there's this whole chapter in the book about beware of teachers. Oh, yeah. You know, and a great warning to people, you know, and this comes out of now, you know, lots of people come to me and they say, okay, I read your books and you inspired me and now I'm going and I'm practicing at this right. place, at this Zen center or this Tibetan place. And I'm like, oh no, I don't want you to go there. That teacher will rob you blind and sleep with your wife. You know, and so uh, I, you know, sometimes I feel this responsibility of like, I want to inspire you to practice. I certainly didn't want you to sign up for that cult or with that corrupt teacher. Uh -huh. And, you know, like the Buddha says, like, he's not a guru. He's not asking for your, you know, bows. He's asking for you to do what you need to do for yourself, to free yourself. Because uh, one person I've, I've spoken to recently on this show said, uh, it, it's really important that you have a teacher so that you don't lose your way and get grandiose somehow. I'm not sure if I agree. Yeah. If you can find a trustworthy teacher, it's wonderful. It is really wonderful. There's uh, a lot of corruption out there in yeah. teachers. You know, the Buddha's last words, as he was dying, as we end this, you know, we're getting close to the end of this. The, the, the Sangha was pressuring him to, to name a successor, to create a lineage and to say, who's going to be our teacher now? And he said, if you're asking that question seriously, you haven't gotten my teachings. Yeah. If you're still looking for someone to save you, if you still need a teacher, I've taught you what to do. You know what to do now. Seek no external refuge. Quit looking out there for it. Be a lamp unto yourself. Be a guide, a light unto yourself. And strive forth. Be diligent. Put effort into your practice and you will find Nibbana. Yeah, Alan Watts uh, said a couple of things about it. That a, a guru came to him one time and said, you should be my student. And Alan looked at him and said, who was Buddha's teacher? <laughs> And the guy started laughing. And, and uh, Watts says, you need a teacher if you think you need one. Teachers are so good and important in the beginning. We need yeah. someone to teach us how to practice. Well, and along the road, if you have a good teacher, it's wonderful. You know, uh, I've been in relationship with Jack Cornfield for uh, 
17 years, 15 years, something like that. He's my teacher. He trained me to teach. Right. He's very trustworthy. I really honor him. I've been watching how he lives for the last 15 years, not just what he says. Right. And that's very, very important. I totally have you know, trust and, and faith in him. Uh, I've had relationships with other teachers over these 15, 20 years that weren't so trustworthy. But the good you ones. Know, and weren't living what they were saying. Oh, okay. Um, and so we, we do have to be quite careful. And if you find a good one, and the problem is, is that a lot of the good teachers won't take you as a student. They're too smart for that. <laughs> and a lot of the teachers that are like, yes, I'll be your guru, those are the ones that you've got to be careful for. Uh -huh. You know, like Jack won't take people as his, you know, student. Like you can go on retreat with him, but you're not going to get a lot of time with him. Uh -huh. You know, and the ones that are like, yeah, sure, you know, why don't you have your wife come over later? Yeah. <laughs> you got to be really careful, really careful. Yeah. So as we end this, are there some final words that you have? Uh, you know, just an encouragement for everyone to trust themselves and, and to, you know, find out what's true for them and to meditate, you know, to do the work, not think about it, not talk about it, not read about it, but to sit down and shut up and pay attention. Start with the breath, expand to the body and the heart and the mind. And uh, everything that you're looking for, you'll find if you do the work. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, how can people get a hold of you, Noah? Uh, probably dharmapunks.com is the best way. All right. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright, and I've been your host today on Attunement. And we've been talking with my guest, Noah Levine, who has, uh, was the author of Dharma Punks and now a new book called Against the Stream, A Buddhist Manual for Spiritual Revolutionaries. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright. I've been your host today, and thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Thing, 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 and we'll see you next time.